dear friends, it's always nice to see you back and the old ones and new ones. And we hope these lectures that we go, that we give every, every month twice, uh, bring a lot of joy to everybody. Uh, I, I, these are difficult times for all of us, but let's hope that these lectures change the mood and give you some hope and the hope that one day we'll go back to, to a country we all so love and so interested in and is going through such difficult, difficult times. We, we feel for you and we hope that this nightmare will come to an end as soon as possible. Um, I hope that today, Navina, I'm sure will change the mood of everybody with her wonderful lecture. And uh, let me say a few words about Navina before she takes the podium. Um, Navina, as you know, is the curator of the Islamic department at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, she received her doctorate from the University of Oxford's Oriental Institute. Um, her, the, 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 the chair that she holds right now as curator is the Nasser al-Sabah, al-Ahmad al-Sabah, um, the, the great Kuwaiti collector who recently also died. Um, at the Met, she was involved in the planning of a number of exhibitions. Uh, as I love the Deccan, I was really, really happy, and I think most of us were, to see finally the, this a wonderful exhibition she organized with Marika Sardar, Sultans of Deccan, India, 1500, 1700, Opulence and Fantasy in 2015. This was really a very important exhibition for the first time after years, if not forever, if I, I can't remember another exhibition of this type, um, uh, the, the arts of the Deccan came to focus. And uh, I think thanks to this exhibition, many more people became interested in this region. And uh, while in the early years, in the 90s, there were only four or five scholars. Now there, there is a plethora of scholars working in different subjects on the Deccan. And I think uh, the exhibition that uh, Navina organized really meant a great deal to everybody and contributed to this um, interest. Other exhibitions were Treasures from India, Jewels from the Altani Collection in 2014, Divine Pleasures, Rajput Paintings from the Quran in 2016. Navina never stops, so she keeps on planning new things, even at these difficult times, and her future exhibition at, uh, at the Met will be on, on Jahangir uh, and his period. She's concurrently working on a book on Mughal architecture and is involved in several independent educational conservation and creative initiatives in the Middle East and India. I think we would all prefer to hear uh, Navina than myself. So please, Navina, take the chair. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, greetings, everyone. And uh, I'm really thrilled to be here. It's early in the morning in New York. Um, and I just can't believe I'm connected with so many people around the world at this moment. So that's all thanks to the kind um, invitation from the Deccan Heritage Foundation and the Center for Islamic Studies at Cambridge to whom I'm very grateful for this honor to be able to speak today. Um, it's hard to think or talk about India at this moment of tragedy and suffering. What India is going through right now is indescribable. And for those of us who live outside the country, far from our loved ones, we feel helpless and heartbroken at all that is going on. I would therefore like to start by dedicating this talk to the families and the individuals in India who have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Their sorrow is shared by so, much, so many of us. Um, and I personally am so inspired by the courage and the love that is shown by those who have selflessly helped each other, even as the authorities have failed to do so. I hope my talk brings fresh air and good dreams to those who have faced so much stress and warm greetings for the festival of Eid as well. My talk today is based on an earlier one that I gave some weeks ago as part of a program organized um, around the film uh, that's being produced, uh, a film that's called Other Kohinoors by Uma Magal and Mahnoor Yar Khan, which aims to spread appreciation of the rock heritage of, of the Hyderabad region. And on that occasion, I was privileged to be in conversation with Kathleen James Chakravarti and Abir Gupta. Um, and so this talk is a development of, of an earlier one. Um, 
My talk today aims to awaken our sensitivities to the role of landscape and ro rockscapes of the Deccan in the art of court painting. Um, this topic, however, does not lend itself to a chronological or theoretical approach, except perhaps in a certain moment and certain specific area of late 17th century Mughal and Deccani court painting. Rather, I've found that it's best approached through a series of groupings and ideas that allow us to understand how Mughal and Deccani painting styles evolved as an interplay between real and imagined landscapes that came to the painter's brush through a variety of artistic, environmental, and textual sources. I have therefore uh, organized the discussion into categories uh, small categories and embedded among them is a sort of longer category, which is a more scholarly dis discourse, uh, I hope, and the rest, uh, my other categories, I hope will be engaging and perhaps even amusing, um, because I'm trying to keep us very, very happy and very positive and renewed by the majesty of the Deccani landscape and all that it has given us in the past and, and in the present, and hopefully we will be able to preserve some of it for the future. So having said that, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, just confirming that you can see it. It looks, it looks great, yeah. Okay, great. So um, rocks from a brush uh, tells you that I'm talking mainly about painting today with some, some deviations. Um, and artistic encounters with Deccani rocks, mountains and landscapes is the focus of my talk today. I'll start by reminding us of something that <clears throat> we, we maybe don't know, which is that, that the um, Deccani landscape and the Deccani rocks that you see on the surface are among the most ancient on the entire planet. They have been dated by geologists to more than 2,500 million years in age. And um, there are various ways in which there's a lot of literature, obviously, um, scientific literature, uh, but for a layperson, um, there's, there's a lot of explanations, uh, published discussions of this, this landscape as well. And um, one of the ones that I'm quoting here is a description of these three types of kind of hilly arrangements of rocks, um, which are called Inselbergs. Uh, technically, and one of them are sort of their shallow, um, shallow rocks, a sh a sort of shallow rising uh, arrangements, which are called whalebacks, and then higher domed or castellated ones, uh, castellated meaning that a kind of pile of rocks is actually uh, broken up into or pixelated almost into an arrangement of smaller rocks, and that's what you're seeing in the foreground here, uh, and these are sort of called, uh, these inselbergs are island hills of rocks. Um, and you see that they contain microclimates and ecosystems are quite extraordinary, especially when they're broken up into these smaller pieces, which are all fixed together in, this in, in these incredible sculptural forms. You can see that beyond the rocks, the land can be actually quite flat. It can be gently undulating, but also quite flat. And so you get these remarkable compositions where you have a dramatic jutting out piece of rock, a rockscape or a set of castellated rocks against uh, a relatively plain ground. That's one of the kind of common things you see, especially in the Northern Deccan where the rocks are just beginning. Um, as you get to the area of the Tungabhadra River, uh, which is the site of the Vijayanagar Empire remains of some of the, some of the most important ones, the central ones uh, in Hampi, you begin to see perhaps the most extraordinary constellations and arrangements of these rocks. And what I have on the screen here is, is, a, is a picture of how tall they can become and how um, dramatic they appear uh, along the riverside and how um, I think beautifully and organically the architecture grows out of it. Um, today, the challenge is that the rocks are being exploded, dynamited in order to create the new cities of the Deccan. But in the past, the cities of the Deccan rose out of the rocks, uh, harmonized with the rocks, and their identity is buried in the rocks, as you can see here. Um, this is a view from the Matanga Hill looking outwards. Um, and I wanted to show it because um, it's, it's a very interesting uh, set of a receding landscape in which you can see what 
the larger view looks like. Uh, you have these gentle sort of sloping uh, hilly arrangements of, of rocks. And in between them, in these areas, like here and here, you can actually see plain flat pieces of greenery, green, flat pieces of green ground. Um, and so that rhythm between the flat green and the rising rocks is something I'd like you to keep in mind uh, as a very Deccany landscape that does appear uh, in, in the in the painters, um, has seeped into the painter's imagination and, and style, as, as I hope to demonstrate. Um, there are also, uh, I mean, of course, the Deccan is famous for its rock cut caves. The rocks have always uh, interfaced with, uh, well, been a place or a site of in artistic interface, spiritual retreat. Uh, all those great rock cut cave sites, I'm not going to talk about them from the ancient period, but there are also other lesser known um, planes of in, uh, artistic uh, sort of interface with, with the rock art. And one of them is this extraordinary site in, this, in the river known as um, the Sahasralinga uh, site, which is a, a small river site um, in Karnataka where you have a, uh, a thousand lingams or maybe more carved into the rocks that are in the river and they are only revealed when the water's low and when the water's high, they disappear. Um, it's a most dramatic and amazing um, and slightly mysterious place. And in fact, if you walk around, um, you know, and you explore the deck and you often find that the river rocks are, are a place where all sorts of interesting imagery appears. So these opening slides of mine are really just to give you a sense of the extraordinary landscape of the deck and when it comes to the rocks and the different ways in which the rocks are actually, um, you know, how they, how they act as artistic sort of meeting points. One of the most famous features of the deck and on the Western side are the so-called deck and traps, which are these sort of taller mountains, volcanic mountains that uh, are in fact the site sometimes of, of these rock cut caves. But I mean, I am showing them to you here because they have very distinctive taller, sharper ridges, ridges than, uh, than we've seen in some of the others uh, that I've shown you. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Krishna's butter ball as this great boulder is called. Uh, this is one of many singular individual boulders which uh, dramatically perch on the edge of cliffs or on the edge of slopes. Um, sometimes in individually, sometimes in relationship to each other. But what's, what's uh, interesting is that the whole culture develops around an individual rock and it can acquire a name coming out of mythology. Uh, the newer ones say things like, you know, hamburger rock and, you know, um, uh, you know, mushroom toadstool, etc. But the, the older rocks, which have, I mean, the rocks that have their older names uh, refer, of course, to mythological um, ideas that this is Krishna's butter ball, which is in Mahabalipuram. And the final um, sort of vista of, of the Deccani rocks that I give you is a site that very few people I know visit, but it's, it's actually a, a sort of rock come cave site uh, known as the, uh, made of limestone, unlike granite, which is what we've been looking at mainly. Um, and this site is, uh, these are the Yana caves which um, are in, also in Karnataka. And you can see how uh, extraordinary this, this landscape is uh, with the rich, dense forest, and then these um, you know, almost architectural rocks rising out from the middle. So this is really just to introduce you to some of the varieties of landscapes that you find and rockscapes in the Deccan. And to set ourselves up to ask the question that, even when we are living, uh, thinking about a very, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, tight painting tradition, one that is mediated by, by very powerful traditions and ways of doing things, what impact does do these dramatic landscapes, if any, have on the work of individual artists? Uh, and how can we approach this question? So this takes us really into uh, into the materials a little bit. And I think the first thing for us to remind ourselves is about the tradition of the Sino-Persianate mountains and rocks, as I've called them, which have this long journey uh, from China to Iran and India. Um, and 
And I say that because um, a great deal of scholarship has been done on this extraordinary movement of styles, um, which uh, you can see uh, find in some sense their, their origin in, uh, in, in landscape painting, uh, early landscape painting in China. And that's a, uh, an image that you have on the left of summer mountains um, attributed to uh, Chu Ding and uh, attributed to the 11th century. Uh, and on the right hand side, I've included a, uh, a rock, uh, a scholar's rock, which are, uh, which are these incredibly, um, well, I, they're not easy to date these objects, I imagine, but these natural forms uh, that have been of great uh, value to the culture and also resemble, of course, uh, the kinds of forms that you find in paintings. Also, they have, in this case, the kind of surface that I'd like to draw attention to, which is um, a rough surface which has holes in it uh, and this kind of craggy distinctive shape. Um, uh, this, this kind of style is something that circulates uh, in the Persian world, in part through the movement of, of Chinese ceramics, um, and while I have to say the scholarship has not completely to me explained how the transmission from very large uh, paintings uh, uh, goes into manuscripts, but that is still an area that I'm, I'm investigating uh, in the scholarship. But you can see, for example, on the right hand side, this Ming period um, dish that has a kind of central feature of a craggy rock, uh, a bit like the scholar's rock that I showed you, a bit like the mountains that you saw painted. Um, and here on the left, you see a blue and white bowl made in Iran, possibly Mashhad, uh, which has an incredible landscape um, far Eastern uh, imagery and then landscape features, including rocks and, and landscapes. And, and we know in the Deccan that um, Chinese ceramics made their way there. There is a quite a uh, understudied group of uh, large Chinese bowls and vessels and jars uh, that um, my colleague Marika Sardar and I were aware of and worked on uh, during the time that we were doing the Deccan show. And those, those are in the Bijapur Museum. Uh, and of course, Bijapur and all the Deccan courts were very much uh, in touch with the painting traditions and styles of Iran and, 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 and Northern India and so on. Um, I just, just to continue on these early mountains, uh, the reason I'm bringing them up in particular is because if you look at the Ilkhanid mountains, um, painting, the depiction of, of, of mountains and hills in Ilkhanid painting, which is the sort of earliest period that scholars have identified as showing, uh, you know, connections with far Eastern styles. Uh, we see from the uh, Morgan Beastery on the left, and also this, uh, one of the pages from the so-called small Shahname in our collection from the right, on the right, um, these distinctive features of the mountains that are that they are tall and they're soaring and they somewhat resemble the Chinese style that we saw in the painting that I first showed you, but also um, something that scholars again haven't really commented enough on and I'm curious about, which is the color. You begin to see that uh, there is a tinting effect, um, especially with the introduction of pinks and purples um, and to some extent the red and also the blue, but really it's the pink and the purple that begins to show up um, for example, on the right here, you see Iskander wandering in the mountains, uh, and you can see that the mountains have those kind of holes, uh, those, that surface and that coloration. And, the, and it becomes really the thing that travels to, um, it, well, it becomes very popular in, in Iran and India, Indian painting um, from, well, those were early pa paintings from the 14th century, and now we're looking at uh, 16th century paintings. Um, and these are just, this is just an example from, um, from a well-known uh, uh, example from Kazvin. And the idea here is to really show, show you and to just remind ourselves that, that those pink and purple mountains now is the kind of standard way of doing mountains. Uh, and this is becoming a kind of a international, let's say pretty much an international uh, style that is now accepted. So when the Seymour uh, carries Zal up to her nest in the Albors mountains, which according to one legend are made of jewels. Um, uh, sh those mountains are shown in the in the, in the style now of these sort of tinted pink and purple mountains of so-called Chinese inspiration. 
So this is a kind of style that is becomes a received style, uh, a transmitted style, and a, a, a kind of conventionalized style of doing mountains and doesn't really necessarily have anything to do with real mountains. Um, now, when we're thinking of the Deccan, I'm trying to think of just one painter who uh, has, who we associate with the Deccan vision, if you like, and is a very influential figure in, in the history of Deccani painting, and both in the North and in the South. And that would, of course, be Farooq Hussain, who is a fascinating figure uh, associated with the court of Bijapur and the patronage of Ibrahim Adil Shah II. Um, and without going into all the stories and theories about Farooq Beg versus Farooq Hussain, uh, Farooq Beg as he was known in the north, Farooq Hussain as he was known in the south, uh, and the attribution of paintings. Suffice it to say that almost all scholars have agreed that, the, that they are the, uh, likely to be the same person. Um, and the big question about Farooq Beg in the north is that when he came to the south, his painting style, not only did his name change, I mean, he from the Beg, which is a, an honorific, he's known as Farooq Hussain in the South, um, but not only did his, do we have a sort of slight problem with, uh, with sort of reconciling the name and the trajectory, which is why scholars have been engaged in the story of Farooq Hussain, but it's his style, his style that was so dramatically transformed from a far more restrained and conventional style when he was working in, in Kabul and then later on in the Mughal court uh, to a completely wild and liberated style as, as has been described when he came to the Deccan. Um, and while we often have asked ourselves what made Farooq Hussein change, what made him become uh, a dramatically different artist, we've asked ourselves about the patronage um, and we've asked ourselves about the sources. Uh, in doing thinking about this material, I realized we hadn't really perhaps asked ourselves enough about the environment and about the actual landscapes in which the sensitive and brilliant artist might have found themselves. Um, so if, when you look at uh, the picture on the left, that's from the, <clears throat> from the Dawn album um, and probably an illustration from the, uh, from Jami's Nafahat al-Uns uh, showing the story of the the lion who had to carry this, the logs on his back uh, after he ate the, the, the ass of the uh, holy man. Um, and the story is, of course, set in these most dramatic and extraordinary um, rocks. Uh, I think a lot of work needs to be done on the dating of this particular painting um, to establish where in Farooq Beg's uh, oeuvre we would place it. So I'm bringing it up only as a sort of work in progress but the painting on the right, which shows uh, Ibrahim, has been identified as Ibrahim Adil Shah II in a landscape, in a fantastic landscape. If we look at that landscape in the back, um, we can see the way uh, the artist has um, treated the landscape. The appearance of those purple, pink, fantastical rocks are, are, is quite distinctive and then beautifully melded with the landscape details, the, the trees, the birds, um, and just the mastery of color, the way the greens glow and the purples gr glow and are set off against each other. Um, a, tr a truly uh, uh, masterful uh, rendering of landscape and atmosphere uh, and all those details that we've been talking about through the painter's brush. So my question when it comes to Farooq Beg and the Deccani vision is, is just to imagine what why this artist was suddenly visualized as patron in such an extraordinary landscape. What, what is the deep, deep motivation and the, and the root for that within the artistic uh, artist imagination? Now, I've put my, the rest of my rocks, now that we've sort of got the received tradition and I've shown you how Farooq Beg or demonstrated how I think Farooq Beg might have inter interwoven, received rocks with sort of things that he's, he might have been inspired by. I've organized my remaining rocks in, in categories that I hope will uh, somewhat maybe amuse you. We start with epic rocks. Um, and epic rocks are rocks that come from, uh, you know, they're not real rocks. Again, they're coming from a kind of epic narrative tradition. Um, and in this case, I'm, I'm showing you uh, a folio from the Shahname of Shah Tamas, which was executed in, in the early 16th century in Tabriz and was a very influential uh, manuscript 
for paintings and painters everywhere. All the great masters, <clears throat> father and sons, although it's not, there's not a single signature, great many attributions have been made by many scholars. And we know that, uh, you know, multiple generations, two generations uh, of great artists worked together on it and came up with many styles. And one of them was Sultan Muhammad. You see here in this painting that depicts the discovery of fire, the, the, the setting is a kind of incredible rocky landscape. And when we look closely at the rocks, and because we have the painting at the Met, I'm able to take, take these very close up pictures and share with you. Of course, you can see what is very well known and celebrated about these rocks is the, the hidden faces that are sort of mysteriously inserted into, uh, into these, these rocks. Um, now, often, you know, as painters, as, as scholars, we, we tend to see these as a little eccentricity or, you know, just a little stylistic flourish. Um, nobody has really completely decoded the meaning of these hidden faces uh, in the rocks, although, although there have been attempts. Um, Carrie Welch had speculated that the uh, enemies of the Shah were all depicted in groveling positions in, in the rocks. Um, Michael Barry has uh, speculated that the legends of Solomon uh, to do with the rocks, the spirits of the rocks and the genies having been locked up in the rocks and sealed in there by Solomon is one of the um, uh, sort of meanings of these, these images. Um, looking closely at these, these and these are just some I could have, I could comb through our paintings day and night and take lots and lots of hidden paintings as, as we could all do because they're, they're there once you start looking at them. Um, I would just like to point them out a little bit. I've circled them with the yellow so that you can see clearly. Uh, so you can see that there's a sort of a bear's face and a human face with a beard. And here there seems to be a couple and then another profile face. Um, but also down below, some of the more craggy rocks that are sticking out below have more impressionistic um, profiles. You can't always say that they are clearly articulated as a face, but certainly there is a sense of profiles with eyes, and that's a very kind of uh, common thing to see also, just the kind of impressionistic uh, way, which is even more in some ways interesting than, than because, because there's so much uh, interpretation and atmosphere that, that comes about in a very subtle way through these, through these rocks. So this is an epic sort of landscape and the rocks are coming to us from the narrative of the Shahnameh. The Shahnameh is of course um, not, uh, you know, quite rare, but also illustrated in the Deccan and also in, in the Mughal world. Um, and here we have uh, pages from a small Shahnameh, which, uh, to which, uh, uh, and I've relied on Laura Weinstein's uh, research. Uh, she's done a lot of research on this particular manuscript and assembled it together. It's a very interesting, uh, delicate um, uh, pr product. And actually, the Met has about four or five pages of it. And um, you can see that the received rocks, the epic rocks in this in this Dekini Shahname, basically are of the purple pink variety. Uh, they are actually quite simplified. You don't see a lot of faces, um, uh, but you do see uh, that they are related to the kinds of rocks. So no surprise there. I'm just bringing them together because we're on the subject of epic rocks. I would like to throw out a mystery object, which is the one on the right, um, which is a painting um, which has been attributed to Aurangabad in the north. Uh, Northern Deccan, but sometimes some scholars think it might be actually Rajasthani. Um, but you have this amazing rockscape in the back uh, with women in, in, in walking amongst them, uh, carrying, carrying um, earthenware pots. And in the foreground, you have two demonic figures who are fighting over a camel bone or a camel leg. Um, and I'm, I'm only citing the one on the left because that comes from a different kind of an epic. Uh, the, the Hari Vamsa and shows Krishna lifting Mount Govardhan, which is also realized as a kind of extraordinary uh, mountain of, of rocks. So these are our epic rocks, if we want to think of them that way. Um, and they slightly contrast with the mystic rocks, which is another category of kind of um, rock. Uh, and in this, in this category, I'm really going to discuss 
one of the most important um, and singular paintings that's associated with the Deccan. Um, and that's the one on the left, which is at, in Oxford at the Bodleian Library. And um, we were privileged to have it in the Deccan show in 2015. Um, this famous painting, which was copied um, by Mir Kalan Khan in the 18th century, has been attributed as is, is the flagship of a painter who's known as the Bodleian painter. Uh, and um, there has been very interesting work done on this painting by many scholars, including Keelan Overton, who's, who's put together um, uh, a, a, a possible of, uh, actually a possible group of, of attributions uh, for this painter. Um, and I've relied on her scholarship and discussion to some extent. Um, but what's interesting here is you see a Sufi figure. You see, well, not just one, you see a group of mystics who are meeting. Um, uh, they seem to be from different traditions. Uh, each one has different attributes. It's been speculated that the figure here, um, who, who might actually, I mean, at one stage, people were thinking that it was Ibrahim himself. Now there's a new thought because his eyes are closed. He might be a blind mystic. Um, this figure next to him might be a Hindu figure because he's covered in blue ash. This figure here has the very long nails and the Sufi position. Um, but the setting is what I'm drawing attention to. <clears throat> we can see in this painting a mazar, a, uh, a grave uh, marker. It's, it's a grave uh, marker and you see the flags that indicate that it is a, um, a Sufi uh, religious establishment. You also see standards. Uh, we published a lot on the on the image of the bird, which is drawn from a European source. Um, but where is he? What is this particular place? It is a rocky hill, a man-made hill uh, or wall. It's made uh, very beautifully dressed rocks, nicely arranged with steps that go up to this platform where the um, holy man sits. Uh, these round things here are thought to be weights. Uh, which is uh, one of the, the, the things they used to use uh, as exercise, um, div, you know, sort of exercise uh, aids. Um, and that takes us, of course, to uh, a site in, in um, outside Bijapur, which is known as the Shapur Hillock. Uh, and this was an important site that uh, Richard Eaton has written about and, and in, in some detail and other scholars too. It was an important site for Sufi uh, establishments uh, and lineages that was based uh, right outside the city and had uh, an important role to play in the history and the uh, interplay between the court and the Sufi orders. Um, and you can see what's interesting about it is that it's actually one of the few sites that's built up from that very distinctive dressed stone. It's very, very speculative on my part to put this site together as possibly the one that we see this holy man in, but not completely impossible. You can see that there are many structures and platforms up there. Um, and the, the whole thing is a kind of a hill, <clears throat> the side of which has been strengthened with these um, very nicely dressed stones. Uh, and it is one of the kind of well-known sites for, for, uh, Sufi, uh, for the Sufi order. So I'm just throwing it out there as a possibility. And I think that Keelan Overton has also come to the same possible speculation. Um, as we proceed with mystic rocks, um, we've seen a sort of man-made um, center, Sufi center, but there's also, of course, open, um, open settings, which have mountains and, and, and hills. And this is uh, one that you see here on the left-hand side, which shows the meeting of a yogini and a, and a holy man. And the, the, the element that you see in the background, that beautiful purple, now you, we are all sort of attuned to it. When we see it, we know that it's meant to be a mountain uh, beyond which there are sort of further landscapes. Um, and that does make me recall the, the painting of by Basavan of Plato and Alexander, again, meeting in a mystic transmission uh, and a philosophical transmission in, in a kind of rocky cavescape. Um, I'll keep moving for the sake of, of speed uh, and time, uh, just to say that mystic rocks appear on, on Bidri as well. And you often find sort of dramatic hills with tiny uh, bits of architecture. The rocky hills of Mecca, 
uh, are really to do with a small manuscript that the Met has, which has been attributed to the Deccan and to a site called Khare Patan and dated to 1687. Uh, it's a manuscript called the Futu al Haramain, which is a traveler's um, guidebook to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. And in contrast to most Futu al Haramain manuscripts, which are quite conventional, I mean, they're all pretty conventional and they follow a tight order of, of images and, and styles. Um, our Deccani manuscript is filled with the most extraordinary and cheerful rocks, which the artist has inserted. The area around Mecca is quite hilly, um, but they certainly don't have hills quite like this. Um, I've marked up, I hope you can see on the screen. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all the details, but these are actually known sites uh, and just difficult mountains um, uh, as he's described them. Uh, and here we have a picture of the holy city, which is entirely surrounded by mountains uh, from the brush of this Deccani artist, as opposed to more conventional at, um, sort of approaches to uh, which are which, of the manuscript from those produced in Iran and, and Turkey. Uh, you find that the Deccani one, this particular one, has got these kind of landscape flourishes, which um, take us back to that sort of idea of, of the impact of the of the mountains and landscapes. Rocky Love Stories um, is just to make us, uh, you know, remember how useful the rocks are when it comes to the dramatic and often doomed love stories of Sufi literature. Um, in this case, we have the story of Shirin and Farhad. Farha uh, Shirin, who's spied by Khusro, Prince Khusro, who falls in love with her beauty, but so does Farhad, the humble uh, sculptor. Uh, and he is then challenged to make a channel of milk from the rocks, which is what he's done uh, in order to impress her. And here, if you look at the rocks, you can sort of see an impressionistic bird sitting over them and lots of profile forms that look down. In fact, here's Farhad's horse, uh, I mean, Shirin's horse looking up at this profile rock, they're almost exchanging a glance. Uh, there seems to be a connection between uh, organic and inorganic forms, the spirit that pervades paintings such as this. Um, and we've got um, a Deccani version of the same uh, subject, which is in the David collection, which shows uh, Shireen bathing in, in the river and uh, Khusro uh, spying her. And this is a most extraordinary rock, uh, rockscape, as you can see. The rocks have gone completely wild here. Um, they're filled with the spirit uh, that we, we see in the Deccan. This painting from the same uh, Husra and Shirin, manus um, not same manuscript, but same story, uh, is in the Aga Khan collection. And we see that the rocks here play a completely different role they have a great presence in the painting, but they spill across the surface almost like treacle and they sort of create uh, separate areas for the narrative to be outlined. So uh, what a lot of use we have for rocks when it comes to rocky love stories. Um, and I end this section with this rare painting of Ibrahim Adil Shah uh, with his consort who was supposed to be a, a Maharashtrian beauty. Um, uh, and this, this work shows the two of them against these kind of dramatic rocky uh, dr rocks in the background. Rocks of Power is really about the landscape and the identity of the rulers of the Deccan, um, and that includes the Mughals later. But let's start by looking at an 18th century version on the left of Chand Bibi, who is never depicted in her time, which is in the late 16th century in Ahmednagar. But in the 18th century, century, we find a great revival or suddenly invention of the image of Chan Bibi, often shown running across a wide landscape holding a hawk. Now, I'd like you to look at that landscape and note that you have those pink rocks with areas of flatness in between, which is very much what you see in this view from Matanga Hill that I, I first pointed out, that same sense of undulation mixed with uh, and these flat areas. And to me, these landscapes really speak to each other. So I was always ready to dismiss these John BB pictures as sort of just complete fantasies. But in, in fact, I find that they have more uh, relationship with the landscape than a lot of other pictures. 
The Met has a famous uh, image of the house of Bijapur, uh, which brings together all nine rulers of the Bijapur house uh, in a kind of fantastical setting with a carpet sit seated on an, in an outdoor landscape, uh, soaring hills, uh, distant seas uh, in the background and um, a, a globe which shows, uh, sort of echoes the kind of background um, hills uh, in, in the depiction of landscape on the globe as well. Um, these are open to various types of interpretation. People have seen them as uh, expressions of the Bijapur territorial ambitions um, that was uh, published by Carrie Welch um, early on when the painting was, was acquired by the Met. But I want to point out something in the background that I haven't really figured out, uh, but I'm speculating again here. Uh, there's one area behind those uh, dramatic hills that shows this application of this beautiful vivid yellow color, uh, which is created by a pigment known as Indian yellow, which many of you art historians will know that comes from the urine of cows. It's a very ex special and um, vivid color. Uh, and you see it laid out <clears throat> on an area of the landscape and I'm showing you very close up pictures. And I just wonder when I look at a photograph like this, uh, whether in fact we are seeing a rare depiction of mustard fields, which is very, very typical for North India, uh, the, the fields themselves. In South India, I haven't seen them quite as much, uh, but that would be very interesting and quite rare if we were actually able to speculate. You can see how close it looks to a mustard field uh, that in fact, this artist has shown something like, like, like that, like mustard fields in the background. Let's keep going because um, I don't want to lose time. Um, I'm showing you other pictures from Golconda uh, with, with rockscapes in the background that very much resemble um, actual rockscapes. But I'm getting to um, the, the final part of my talk today, which is really about the rocky relationship um, that was uh, the one between the Mughals and the Deccan. And this part of the material really lends itself to a more analytical approach, conventionally analytical approach um, that really traces a chronology uh, and, and follows a storyline of history. Now, as we know that the, the Deccan in the late 1680s, uh, Bijapur and Golconda were the last two Deccan states to fall to Mughal conquest, but the program of conquering the Deccan had been established very early in the Mughal um, strategy. Uh, and from the time of Akbar, uh, princes were sent, Mughal princes were sent to serve in the Deccan and uh, almost all the Mughal princes from 1620 onwards were in and out of the Deccan. The Northern part of the Deccan was really a Mughal stronghold for many, many decades and was the base from which they pressed down uh, upon, upon the South until its eventual conquest. But uh, in, in the Shah Jahan Nama in the, uh, in the um, illustrated history of Shah Jahan. There are many, many scenes of conquest um, uh, and forts and fortresses and landscapes and settings that have been depicted. Um, and among them is the, is the fort of Dolatabad in the Northern Deccan, which was conquered, I think in 1633. Uh, and when I, on the left, you see the illustration from the Padshanama of Dolatabad fort. Uh, you can see that there are several rings of fortification. And then this amazing, I don't know what to describe it as other than a birthday cake, uh, because it sort of has these great walls and a sort of mountain of um, things above uh, resembling something like a cake. Um, and until you actually go and see the site, you realize how accurate and incredible it is. I was able to find the photograph on the right-hand side that shows Dolatabad in, in the monsoon, so it's very green. But you can see that it's a sort of great, um, uh, the, the walls uh, are these sort of incredible uh, granite walls and they hold up a virtual mountain upon which that uh, fort is built. Uh, and certainly it impressed the author of the uh, Pachanama because it is described as a mighty fortification, which is in reality nine fortresses situated on a splendid granite mountain of the utmost magnitude and height. 
So you're beginning to see the impact of these real settings uh, on the artists of the Pachanama um, in a way that other fortresses perhaps don't look quite as distinctive because they aren't as, as dramatically distinctive. Um, most, the most famous mogul to occupy the Deccan for the last 25 years of his life was of course the Emperor Aurangzeb. And Aurangzeb, you see him here in a painting, um, uh, in a painting at the Met, which um, is by the artist Bhavani Das, an artist I know quite well because he later came to Kishingar and was working for the Kishingar royal family in the 18th century. But here we see a work by Bhavani Das, uh, which is, I've been puzzling about how to date it. I've assumed it's in Aurangzeb's lifetime, um, but I can't be sure about that because then that would make Bhavani Das's life very, very long. I'm still working on it. Um, I've been thinking about it a very long time. Um, but what I want to point out is that I don't know that Bhavani Das ever actually went to the Deccan himself. He is however keen to show that Aurangzeb is in the Deccan because the setting that you see is very much a hilly setting. Um, furthermore, there are two figures in front of Aurangzeb. Um, this might be Bahadur Shah the first, his son, and this might be his son. Um, and you can see these, some of the features in the background. The reason I'm mentioning this is because um, we need to understand who were the cast of characters who were the major patrons in the Northern Deccan in this period. Um, this is a very interesting period. It's a very important period. And I'm relying very much on the scholarship of Terence McInerney and John Seiler, who are the two most recent scholars whose works I've come across, who have tried to sort out the successive patrons and the movement of artists uh, and have come to the conclusion uh, that certain artists, certain patrons have been involved. So very quickly, um, they were Aurangzeb to some extent and for some time, Bahadur Shah for some extent, to some extent and for some time, and Azam Shah, uh, his, Aurangzeb's other son, who I will also show. Now, my point in all of this is that um, through this combined patronage, we begin to see a a genre of painting and settings emerge that we haven't really seen before. And I think they're set in the Northern Deccan and I think they're really to do with the patronage and this evolving style that came about through the artist Hunhar working with the patron uh, Bahadur Shah. And as we've most recently discovered, thanks to John Silas' new research, the artist Elias Khan Bahadur, who was associated most closely with Azam Shah. And I won't go into all the details, but here is an important piece of evidence. We have, um, we have a painting of Shah Alam, as he was known, Mu'azzam, Shah Alam, Bahadur Shah, same person, uh, in the Deccan. In this case, the artist is Anup Chatar, as we can see, or Chitra, and you see him in this kind of open setting. And the inscription tells us it's based in Aurangabad. Uh, here's a painting by Honhar, which shows... Uh, Shah Alam, um, again, same, same patron. Uh, I know it's a bit confusing because he's got three names um, at the same time. But what's interesting here is the, the little landscape that you see below the horse's uh, feet. This is a painting that used to be in the Ehrenfeld collection and is now in the MFA Houston. And Terence McInerney has speculated that that little fortress that you see down there is in fact, um, the fortress, the Janjira fortress of the western coast, uh, because um, Muazzam was sent there to subdue the, the western Deccan. Um, this extraordinary painting, a new acquisition by the uh, David collection, was recently discussed by John Seiler in a fascinating lecture where he attributes it to the artist Ilyas Khan Bahadur. Um, and again, my question would be, this is where, where is this action taking place? Because what you see is a wide open ground with a kind of rising rockscape uh, with those uh, sort of different approach, but, but you can see those castellated rocks that we started off our, very, our discussion with. 
um, and I'm very keen to discuss with John Seiler and get his views on this painting, which is in the Royal Asiatic Society and is actually inscribed in Persian uh, to uh, as being Azam Khan, uh, Azam Shah, uh, which again shows him in a hugely open background with sort of extraordinary imagery, celestial imagery in the sky above. And on the left hand side, you see a distinctive a mountain, which is a kind of flat topped mountain. And I'm, I'm pretty sure if we worked on this, we would be able to find an area where you find in the deck in these kinds of distinctive flat topped arrangements, because that is a particular kind of a rockscape that appears. Um, so this also perhaps is the work of Ilyas Bahadur and is something that's in progress at the moment for me. Um, you can see as we progress through my slides that this, this, this style of showing a ruler thundering across an open landscape with these glorious rocks and, uh, and, and, and sort of settings uh, is a growing uh, genre in this period. Um, and I've interpreted it as not just a convenient setting uh, or even a real setting, but also a symbolic setting of a uh, land that is a contested land, a land uh, which the Mughals are not just seeking to conquer, but are also falling in love with. And a land which means uh, ownership, which shows your ownership and shows your um, ascendancy over it when it's depicted in this way. Um, this wonderful painting, which is again, open for speculation, who is this character? Uh, some scholars think he's Azam Shah, others think he's Bidar Bakht, who's a grandson of Aurangzeb, is shown in this dramatic background. And when you look closely at those rocks, you see a sleeping lion. And there are many other things in the rocks that I haven't included. But I'm just, just reminding you that those kind of arrangements of rocks where you have vertical rocks surmounted by horizontal ones are sort of real, real landscapes that you see, or real rockscapes that you see in the Deccan. Um, and you have more versions of these. So I'm almost at the end of my time here. I'll, I'll, rock, uh, I'll rock you through the end. Uh, we have a bit of rock music to enjoy through the rock, uh, rockscapes of the Ragamala paintings, which come to be in the 18th century. Um, Asavari Ragini and Kakubha are shown in these very dramatic settings, which accentuates the um, kind of meaning of, of the music and of the musical mode. Uh, that is depicted. And before we leave the Deccan entirely, let's just look at Hyderabad. And um, I call these Hyderabadi rocks before Hyderabad, uh, because the modern city of Hyderabad, as I've mentioned, is actually, you know, responsible, unfortunately, for demolishing a lot of this rock heritage. But before that happened, in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries, the depiction of rocks um, in paintings was absolutely um, conventionalized in, in many aspects of Hyderabadi painting. Um, I recently published this work, which uh, is in a private collection in Bombay um, and shows actually a Safavid figure in the Deccan in about 1700. Um, and without going into it too much, you can see uh, the landscape speaks for itself. Um, I was, so inspired by Andrew Topsfield's publication of this material from the Bodleian collections. They have some wonderful, wonderful uh, late uh, paintings which are filled with life and spirit. This one is a fantastical depiction of uh, the fort in Golconda with these absolutely, uh, again, brilliant mountains, uh, purple mountains with little buildings on top. Um, here's the very cooperative tiger walking around uh, with the hunters uh, and a very uh, unbothered prey who are being led and walking through this amazing landscape in which you see those castellated rocks rising up in all kinds of beautiful dramatic um, arrangements. And my last and maybe one of my most favorite paintings to end on uh, is this the scene of elephants in an open landscape with these great boulders in the background. Um, and the boulders, if you look at them, begin to look at them, they begin to sort of take on the form of elephants themselves. Um, the elephants, as they go into the background, as they're arranged in that area, become smaller in size and they, they recede. And only when you get up to this area, 
And you look at the very small elephants in the distance, do you realize how huge those boulders are? Uh, and there's this beautiful harmony here between the life of the elephants, the great setting, the human figures, um, and the landscape. So I hope this is, this is the right place to end my discussion of, of rocks, rockscapes, landscapes, and painters. Um, and I hope it, in, it inspires us uh, towards a vision where we see ourselves in harmony with nature as we should, should ideally be. Thank you. Thank you, Navina. Um, I, we're all giving you an applause from wherever we are. Um,